Good morning. I'm going to talk today about uh, permafrost modeling, but before uh, going to permafrost modeling, I'd like to give a little background on what is permafrost and how we measure it. So permafrost is a frozen soil, and the actual definition is um, it's the soil material which stays frozen for more than two consecutive years. And another definition which I'm going to use in this talk is the active layer sickness. So the active layer sickness is the depth of seasonal sow. So um, <coughs> it occupies 24% of the northern of the land in the northern hemisphere and 80% of the land in Alaska. And uh, when permafrost starts to sow, this uh, it influences on the infrastructure, and you can see that from the pictures, and it's also influenced ecosystem. And the example is, if there's a catastrophic event, such as a forest fires, then <clears throat> it, the forest fire burned the trees, but it's also burned the organic layer on top of uh, the soil, and if that burn is quite severe, then uh, <clears throat> that organic layer might be uh, severely burned, which means that, and it turns out that that organic provides uh, the necessary, uh, it protects permafrost from sowing because it has a very low conductivity during the summer. And when it's gone, then the permafrost is vulnerable to sow. And if the ground has uh, enough uh, segregated ice, then what might happen, uh, that small pound, oops, right, it's small pound might cure, and depending on the amount of ground ice, that pound might <coughs> be uh, developed into uh, a lake, and that lake uh, called the Thermocarst Lake. <coughs> okay, so if we gonna do any economic planning for the state of Alaska, I think it would be wise to include some results from uh, permafrost modeling. So how do we measure permafrost? And we me uh, this is the basic setup. We have uh, permafrost. This is how the permafrost observation station look like. So it's the uh, air temperature. Uh, we measure air temperature. We measure snow depths. And we also measure uh, the ground temperature. And this is the example of shallow uh, borehole measurement station. So it's the sensors ev at, usually at every centimeter, uh, every 10 centimeter depths, <clears throat> and they measure uh, temperature uh, on an hourly basis. But besides uh, those uh, temperature measurements, uh, we also have uh, soil moisture uh, sensors, which measure soil moisture at the, <clears throat> at the unsaturated zone. And it's usually up to three soil moisture sensors, and the depth usually up to 60 centimeters. So, and that soil moisture make the, makes the uh, modeling of permafrost a little bit complicated, because depending on the soil structure, it might hold different amount of water. And uh, you can see, I, I showed on the table, uh, the different uh, soil structures. So, and the, what happened when the temperature drops below zero degrees, uh, it still some of some amount of, of uh, that water remains unfrozen. And uh, of course, uh, we don't input that explicitly into our model. I mean, the information about soil texture. What we do instead, instead we try to fit. Um, yeah, try to fit our uh, unfrozen, we call it unfrozen water uh, function, or in this case, in its curve, uh, to the measured uh, soil moisture uh, data from the site. And uh, we do that by basically, yeah, fitting it, and the A and B is our parameters. It's gonna be more clear on the next site. Here's the map mental uh, model. So it's, uh, it's one of the formulation of the heat flow equation. And in this case, we use uh, the enthalpy uh, formulation. 
And the advantage of this method is that we don't have to explicitly treat the free cell front, uh, free cell uh, moving boundary. And uh, in order to have a unique solution, it of course have to be equipped with boundary and initial condition, and that's the general setup. We have an air temperature uh, at two meter depths, and then the, some ground flux at the bottom, and it's usually, in our setup, it's, yeah, which I'm going to talk later, it's uh, 700 meters below the surface, and uh, at initial temperature distribution, and the uh, unfrozen water uh, con uh, function, it uh, has the following uh, form. So here is the uh, volumetric uh, soil moisture content, and this is the coefficients which I talked previously. Uh, this is the thermal capacity and the thermal conductivity, latent heat. Okay. So how we define active layer? And there is a two major definition of the active layer. One is based on uh, the zero degrees uh, divider. So when, whenever uh, we hit that gap, then we say that up to that depth, it's, uh, it's going to be our active layer. Uh, however, in our model, we define it a little bit different way based on the unfrozen water content. So we defined uh, the uh, so-called unfrozen water saturation coefficient. And whenever that saturation coefficient intersects with unfrozen water function, then at that, at whatever depth it happened, we treat that depth as the uh, active layer depth. And this is the schematic representation of the model. So it's uh, GIPL2 MPI, and GIPL stands for Geo, uh, Geophysical Institute Permafrost Laboratory. Um, <clears throat> and we tried to uh, build our input in, all in uh, ArcGIS format, and the output is also in ArcGIS format, but now it's in NetCDF as well. And I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about my project, uh, which I was involved. So I did the modeling uh, of in high special resolution for the state of Alaska of the permafrost uh, dynamics for 120 years, starting from 1980 till the end of the century. And uh, I used the uh, GCM data, which were downscaled by uh, Scenarius Network Planning for Alaska group uh, to two by two kilometer resolution. And this is monthly averaged uh, air temperature, monthly averaged uh, precip. Input data also include uh, soil organic matter, initial temperature distribution, and uh, the most importantly, the uh, surficial geology uh, map for Alaska. So each that uh, class in the surficial geology map has, ha uh, has a number of layer assigned to each class. And each of that layer has its own thermal physical properties and has its own unfrozen water parameters. <clears throat> we, I equilibrate the model. And after equilibration, I calibrate it for the uh, several sites along the Trans-Alaska and uh, highway, and this is the result from one of them. <clears throat> and then, after calibration, we validate the model with the IPY uh, data set from 2007-2009, and it's uh, more than 60 stations. It's a mean uh, uh, annual ground temperature, mostly at 20 meter depths, and here we have quite a good correlation. And then I also uh, validate our simulations with the uh, mean annual ground temperature for uh, U.S. schools project for Alaska and those uh, mostly shallow borehole stations from one to six meter depths. And uh, I went a little further and did the validation for the uh, active layer thickness. And here the measured data is from a circumpolar active layer monitoring station. And my result look in the following way. So uh, I uh, calculate the uh, uh, mean annual ground temperature, which is above zero and which is below zero, and for, uh, for every year. And then I average that uh, uh, every 10 years. So I have 12 decades. And uh, I mapped it for 2 meters, 5 meters, and 20 meters. And uh, on 2 and 5 meters, I got the trend, uh, decadal trend, which is 3.5, And for 20 meters, I got it a little bit slower. Uh, it's 2.4%.
So when I did all this uh, modeling, this is how the uh, graphical results look like. And now if you guys ask me the question, so what's the very simple question, what's the vulnerability and resilience of permafrost to sell if the climate will continue to warm? I still won't be able to, uh, to give a simple answer. But if you're curious, we can talk later about it. I'll be in the neighborhood. OK, so I add a little intrigue. I think I can move forward. I was visiting uh, CSDMS uh, two weeks uh, at the end of the summer. And when I just uh, got there, we, the, the idea was to uh, incorporate GIPL model into CMT environment. And we were able to do that in the very first day, uh, which was quite surprising. But it's mostly because I did my homework before. I, uh, I uh, rewrote the model so that it satisfied the IRF format. And my feeling is that so far as your model satisfies that format, it's quite easy to make it CMT. OK, and the ultimate goal, of course, to couple that was the ideological model. And I hope that with a uh, little funding and enough desire, that can be done. And at the end, I'd like to acknowledge NSF and State of Alaska and express my gratitude to Arctic Research Supercomputer Center. Uh, those people do a really good job over there. They provide really good services. And I appreciate all these the consultations. And of course, CSDMS. Without them, I won't be here. Thank you. For those of you who have forgotten, Elkin was uh, a student award-winning, uh, he did a student award-winning uh, job in his uh, graduate thesis. Um, so questions for Elkin on permafrost modeling. Yes, Michael. Um, this is very interesting. So obviously, knowing depth of permafrost is, is really important from a carbon cycling point of view. Yes. And I know that there are other efforts to try to do this because even your model requires, if I understand this, a lot of you know, ground data. Yeah. So there are folks who are looking at things like, and I don't know the details about this. I'm hoping you, call, you will sort of say, oh yes. But there are folks looking at things like N factor and degree thawing days to try to develop a proxy to then you know, do these regional estimations. Have you compared? your results to those type of proxies? There is a, yeah, there is a, thank you very much for the question. It's very interesting. But there is, yeah, many uh, people and they are doing different, uh, they, they basically work on different approaches and one of them is uh, doing the, uh, th this uh, freezing, sowing uh, factor analysis. Uh, and we have it in our lab. We have different uh, versions of the model, and one of the versions is actually which is uh, exploring that approach. Um, yeah, there is different approaches, and uh, there is different groups. And the other group is, I think, CCSM. They they doing that this a little bit different way, but the idea is the same. It depends on the on the model, and depend on the dynamics, and depend on the what equation you, you employ. And in this case, it's a transit. It's numerical based. So it's, it's more dynamic. Uh, any other questions for Elkin? OK, thank you. Thank you.